This is AHL Explains. I'm Anthony Ledford and today I'm going to explain futures. Today we're going to look at futures. This is an extremely broad topic as there are futures contracts on thousands of underlyings. For example, stock index futures or commodities or FX, bonds or interest rates. All are represented. And these are traded on hundreds of exchanges worldwide. So to start, we'll have a look at what these different futures contracts have in common and then look at a specific example. So, to start off with, all futures contracts are standardised. What that means is that they refer to a fixed amount of the underlying at some predefined future date. So if I buy a contract today and then sell it tomorrow, I'm back to being flat. I have no residual risk. All futures contracts are traded on margin. This is important because it means if I want to have exposure to, say, a thousand ounces of gold, I only have to put up a fraction of the value of that gold to have the investment exposure. Now, this is particularly important in systematic trading where people target risk. It means that they can do so without needing to borrow money in order to finance positions. Futures contracts are also extremely transparent. So I can see what trades have happened today, I can see the volume of those trades, I can see the price that was paid, I can see what time they were done. I can also get good historical data, both official closing prices and volumes from historical days. This is great from a statistical point of view because it means there's a lot of data there for you to model. Futures contracts are also anonymous in their trading. So although there's high transparency on things like the volume or the price, you don't know the counterparties who are actually involved in those trades. So let's have a look at an example. And the example I'm going to choose is the gold futures contract that's traded on COMEX, which is part of the New York Mercantile Exchange. So the first thing to note is, what's the fixed amount of gold this contract refers to? Well, it's 100 troy ounces. So one contract gives us the investment exposure of the value of 100 ounces of gold. And there are various predefined dates that the contracts are available for. For example, June or December in this or next calendar year. The other thing to note about this contract is it's quoted in dollars per ounce. So if you see the price for it on a trading screen, you'd expect it to be about 1,200. Now, a one-point move in the quoted price, say it goes from 1,200 to 1,201, means that each of the 100 ounces that are referred to by the contract would be incremented by that $1. So the contract value would change by $100 for each point move. Now, another thing about this contract is it's physically settled. So if you hold it to expiry, you either have to deliver or receive gold physically. And the other feature about it that we'll have a look at is that its initial margin requirement is 4%. This number may change, but that's where it is now. So in order to open one contract, I would have to post a certain amount of margin to the exchange. And that would be the 4% multiplied by the 100 for the amount of gold that the contract refers to, multiplied by the quoted price, which is 1200 So that would come to $4,800. Now, that would be initial margin that I would have to pay the exchange. So let's assume I've done this. I've bought the contract at $1,200. I've posted my initial margin. And at the end of that day, the price has jumped up to 1202 Then I would have made a profit. I was long the contract. It's gone up in value. And the value has increased by two points multiplied by the dollar value of each point move, which is $200. Now, that variation margin would be money that I would receive in my margin account. So I would make a profit there. If I held the position open to the next day and looked at the value at the end of the day plus one, and the value was now 11.99, then the price would have actually dropped by three points. So I would have made a loss this time and the size of that loss would be the three points multiplied by the $100 value per point, which would be $300. And this would be variation margin, which I would have to pay. I would have to post to the account. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is the relationship between the price of the futures contract and the price of gold now. 
So this pricing relationship is an idealized representation and buying and selling pressures, supply and demand will mean that this doesn't always hold, but it gives you an idea of how they can be related. So I want to think of two scenarios, and the two scenarios are as follows. The first one is to buy the futures contract and hold it until expiry, at which point I get gold delivered to me. The second way I want to think about, the second scenario, is to borrow some cash use that cash to buy gold and then put it into storage until the same date as the contract in the first case expired. Now if the futures contract had been priced correctly I should actually be indifferent to these different scenarios and what that means is that the futures contract should be equal to today's price of gold multiplied by 1 plus the interest I would incur from borrowing the cash and I'm going to put that as R plus the storage cost of actually storing the gold safely until the expiry date of the futures contract and I'm going to call that S. So this rather idealized relationship expresses the relationship between the futures price and today's price of gold. Um, and clearly buying and selling pressures, supply and demand are going to mean that this doesn't hold always exactly. Uh, the other thing I should say is that this relationship it only really holds for non-perishable items. If you have perishable items, then it's more complicated. So that's all we're going to cover today about futures. They're very liquid, transparent, and available on many underlyings. But the key point that I really want to stress is they're very cash efficient because they're traded on margin. And this is important for targeting risk. We'll see this again in the next chapter where we look at portfolio diversification. But until then, thanks very much.